So we've been pretty positive and upbeat. And here's what Ryan sent me. How to manage a bad relationship. When to try to work on the relationship versus when it is not beneficial any longer. So basically, this whole weekend has been building up on how to get close to each other. And I'm going to talk about how to break up. <laughs> <laughs> and I have agonized over this ever since the topic was given to me. And I'm begging for an easier topic next year. Okay. It can be, you know, we, you could have me speaking Saturday or Friday at midnight and nobody's here, but it's going to have to be easier than this. Okay. I thought, what did I do to deserve this? And, and I honestly, I worked on this. And I was more concerned about what not to say than I was what to say. And not to make light of the conversation, because I want this to be a conversation. Because what we've been doing this weekend, we've been talking about relationships. At least that's how I've seen it. Lean on me. It's about relationships. We might not have used that word a lot, but you're going to hear that word a lot this morning. Relationships. I need you to turn to 1 John chapter 4. And I am going to set a lot of groundwork before I get into uh, the more serious discussion. Although this is serious. But in talking about relationships, I think the best, way, the best place to start is in 1 John chapter 4. Because this is the love chapter of the Bible. Don't let anybody else tell you otherwise. You've heard all your life that the love chapter of the Bible was 1 Corinthians 13. It isn't. It is 1 John 4. For me, I want you to count. You can you read along if you want to. Okay. But I want you to count how many times I read, starting in 1 John 4, 7, the word love. What translation? The one that I'm using. Just listen. Right. Just listen. Okay. okay. Just listen. And, and you can use your fingers, and you're going to have to use his too. Okay? And then you tell me if I'm right or wrong. Seriously. Relationships. First John 4, 7. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us. And his love is made complete in us. We know that we live in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the son of God, God lives in him and he in God. And so we no one rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God, in God in Him. In this way, love is made complete among us, so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment, because in this world, we are like Him. There is no fear in love. Perfect fear, I mean, perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because He first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, Yet hates his brother, he's a liar. For whoever, for anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And he has given us this command. Whoever loves God must love his brother. Is there a theme to this chapter? What might that theme be? Love. What's the basis of a good relationship? You just heard it. But in order to remain traditional, 
we'll turn over to 1 Corinthians 13, okay? Now that you know that the love chapter of the Bible is 1 John chapter 4, and there's evidence to back that up. And I'm just going to read a snippet of that, uh, verse 4, starting. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it, does not, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth, it always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always persevere. Love never fails. And now these three remain faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. What's the basis for any good relationship? It's love. Hands down. Love, by the way, if you didn't know, is the opposite of selfishness. We are all kinds of new things because you thought the opposite of love was hate. But it's not. The opposite of love is selfishness. Because when you love... You will give your whole life for someone else. And you completely rid yourself of yourself because you love. The opposite of love is selfishness. Think about it. Let it sink in for a minute. We're talking about relationships and what relationships are based on. Love. Here's what I believe. And we're going to go through a list. And this is going to set the tone for the scriptures we're going to read in a little bit. And because when I teach a Bible class, I like to read out of the Bible. Yeah, I'm funny that way. What I believe, like I said, I want to set the tone for what we can and what we can or will or will not talk about this morning, because when we're talking about ending relationships, oh man, I was telling Roger this morning, you chase a lot of rabbit holes. You can go down a lot of paths when you're talking about ending relationships. Or when is it time to cut some cut things off? Don't let your mind wander. As I did. I believe there is a friend who loves at all times. Proverbs 17, 17. I believe that there is a friend who is closer than a brother. Uh, Proverbs 18, 24. I believe that we need each other. Look at all the one another passages in Scripture. I'm not going to go over them. We don't have time. Look at all the one and others. I, uh, I've had this book since college. It's, and that was a long time ago. I graduated from OVC in 1980. And I had this book as a freshman, sophomore there. And it's fallen apart. But I got some good tape and I put it back together. And this is, it's called God is No Fool. I doubt that it's in publication anymore. But I've got, I, I want to read you about friends. That's the kind of relationship we need to focus on, friends. Now, there's a lot of kind of different kinds of friends. I'm hoping to get into all that. Okay, please ask questions, raise your hand, shout out, give me some feedback if if the spirit moves you. Okay, or if a mouse runs under your chair and you scream and have to stand up and say something, do that too. Friends. This is number 43, which is neither here nor there, but I've used this ever since college in a whole lot of different situations. Listen to this. It's, it's thoughtful. Bits and pieces, bits and pieces. People. People important to you, people unimportant to you, cross your life. Touch it with love and carelessness and move on. There are people who leave you and you breathe a sigh of relief and wonder why you ever came into contact with them. There are people who leave you and you breathe a sigh of remorse and wonder why they had to go away and leave such a gaping hole. 
Children leave parents. Friends leave friends. Acquaintances move on. People change, change homes. People grow apart. Enemies hate and move on. Friends love and move on. You think on the many who have moved into your hazy memory. You look on these, those present and wonder. I believe in God's master plan in lives. He moves people in and out of each other's lives, and each leaves his mark on the other. You find you are made up of bits and pieces of all who ever touched your life, and you are more because of it, and you would be less if they had not touched you. Pray God that you accept the bits and pieces in humility and never wonder, never question, never regret the bits and pieces, the bits and pieces. October 28th was my last day of work at FedEx. I was there for nearly 40 years. I, I wrote this out and it's posted on a, a pole behind the counter at MedExpress in Elm Grove Wheeling. Because they were one of my customers who were part of my life. And I'm a part of theirs. Bronson's a part of my life. We share, you know, funny stories and, you know, good things back then. Um, Kara, I asked her if she wanted to get lost this morning. Inside joke from years and years, more years than you'd like to think about how many ago. Mike, I've known Micah since, well. And you've had people in your lives that, that have left. And you say, man, I wish I had never met them. But they're a part of you. And you've lost friends through death, rather tragic circumstances, but they're a part of you and you're a part of them. Relationships. Now we're gonna get into the negative side here, I promise, but I want you to hear that. Because I think this is real. You can see how I really love that, that article. Others shape us, case in point. Friendships fade, some naturally occurring. Like I said, I had a nearly 40 year career with, with my job. I, I don't talk to the people that I worked with anymore. Why? Because really, we really don't have anything in common. Our commonality was the job. I, I say that, but there's, there's a guy that texted me the other day that I used to work with, and he said, hey, you want to get together for lunch? Yeah, I'll go to lunch with a couple of them now and again. But FedEx was our commonality. Okay? But that relationship pretty much has ended. It wasn't anybody's fault. It was just naturally occurring. Okay? Said, I'm setting some groundwork. Get this one, this one number six. But you didn't need to know that, but I wanna tell you anyway. I had a friend. I don't think we're friends anymore. I'm not sure what happened. I missed a few of our appointed meetings. I felt sure he'd understand. A couple of times when we were talking, I saw some others approach and gave them my full attention. Forgetting my friend. I felt sure that he'd understand. <laughs> I didn't see him for a couple of weeks, but then when I did see him, I was careful to be enthusiastic and pretended we'd seen each other more often. He moved away. I wrote regularly for a while, but then, well, you know how it is. I'm sure he knew how busy I was. I felt sure that he knew that I thought of him often. I sent him a birthday card. It was a week late, but it was funny. And I was sure he would understand. I recently heard that he'd had some bad luck. I felt sorry for him. I'd like to send him a note just to let him know that I care for we were really, really close, you know. As it happens now, I can't find his address. There's more. Last night I went to a church service and during it we sang, what a friend we have in Jesus. I felt strangely embarrassed. 
Ooh, that one hurts, doesn't it? Now, like, you have to understand, you know, writing and addresses, we, we, we didn't have phones. Phones hadn't been invented, you know, when this thing was written. That was, that was you know, sign in times. But this is real, isn't it? Makes you think. I promised, Roger, I promised I was going to make them think, right? Like, good so far? All right. I'll make them make you think. Your most important relationship is your relationship with God. But that's coming up next. That's not my topic. I believe that marriage is for life. Period. Just leave it at that. I believe it is not a small world. I believe that we're members of a big family. Uh, I really would like to talk now about my traveling, as my wife and I travel a lot. Uh, we're going to be in Gatlinburg next weekend for the, for the week following, just in case you wanted to know that. And Rachel, too. Rachel's coming. And Rachel's coming with us. Well, well, you know, you come here and I go there, and it's happened more than once, okay? I mean... Uh, license plate on that gray Dodge Journey back there. You have to turn around and look at it because you can't see I backed in. It says, go to a park. Because so far, my wife and I have been to about 40 national parks. We just hit five of the, six, five of the seven in Alaska because we had already been to. So we're at about 40 of the 60 plus right now. It's amazing how many connections we have with people that we find in our travels. There was a lady outside of, I told somebody the story the other day, outside of Yosemite in California uh, that we met at church on a Sunday morning where I thought I was going to preach, but I didn't get to. I had to lead singing, though, um, at a little church outside of Yosemite. She talked to us, and she said, Listen, I have a, my husband and I used to work at, uh, at Yellowstone. Uh, we have a cabin there. And gave my wife her email and said, if you ever want our cabin for a few, if you're ever back out at Yellowstone, let me know and I'll let you have our cabin. What do we have in common? We have love and we have God in common because that's the most important relationship. And no matter what else connects you, that's what connects you. Okay? Keep that in mind. We're still laying groundwork. Sometimes... Sometimes you have to draw a line. Not a pleasant conversation to have, but sometimes you have to draw a line. Uh, one that you will not cross. Figurative line, you know what I mean. Relationships can be broken. Fellowship can be severed. These are in no particular order, by the way. We're back to that. Uh, you have personal relationships with some with whom you have little in common. I was telling you about my work relationships, the people at FedEx was our commonality. Think about people you're at church with. If you didn't have God and your faith in common, what would you have common with some of these people? Think about it. But you love those people because that is, to coin a phrase from a really, really good song, the tie that binds. Things are not always black and white. I'll be careful how you interpret that because there is absolute truth, absolute right, and absolute wrong. And I'm talk not talking about that line. But sometimes things are kind of fuzzy as to what you should do. Uh, it might be a personal line. Because I'm not talking about right and wrong. wrong. I'm not talking about disfellowship. If your generation even knows what that means. Taking all this into account, how does one know or feel that your relationship, his or her relationship, isn't working or is not worth pursuing or needs to be severed.
What kind of relationships are we talking about? Here's different kind of relationships that crossed my mind in preparation for all this. Friend to friend. Yes, we can talk about that. Brother or sister, brother or sister. And I'm not talking about blood relatives. I'm talking about the tie that binds. Sometimes those relationships, we can talk about those. Boyfriend or girlfriend, dating, husband and wife, parents and children, you and your God. And in, in the bottom of this page right here, I got in parentheses, next year I asked for an easier topic. <laughs> Since this weekend is all about lean on me, building quality relationships, helping each other and being there for each other, pursuing a relationship with God and with his son, I believe the conversation worth pursuing is number one, a dating relationship. That is something that I'm really not that familiar with. My wife and I have been married for over 40 years. OK, I've not dated anyone in a long time. The closest that I've come to dating anybody since then is probably Rachel my daughter okay we go out together regularly i don't know if that counts or not yeah she takes good care of me friendship or fraternal relationships you know what i mean by that friendships friendships again we are not talking about disfellowship we are not talking about ending a marriage. As I said earlier, there are lines that we cannot cross. Managing bad relationships. When to try to work on the relationship versus when it is not beneficial any longer. Let's go to the Bible. Okay. Now, I'm going to tell you how I did this systematically it took a while uh, I opened Matthew and I started in Matthew and I went through the Matthew I went through the Gospels I went through Acts I went through the epistles page by page by page I did not use any study helps I don't know how to use study helps with this, okay? I am completely incompetent. I did not use any commentaries or study notes. I only looked in the Bible, and I went page by page by page and skimmed passages that I thought would apply. Tried not to get too many, but let's try to make an application having taken all this so far into account. Comments, questions, everybody on the same page so far, you know where we are? You get this? Your head hurt yet? Maybe you think too hard? Are we still good? Still good? Okay. Uh, Matthew 5. Thirteen to sixteen. Um, I know everybody had people read passages for them. I'm going to go ahead and just keep reading. If I need you for something, I'll let you know. Please, if you have a comment or a question, feel free to speak up. This is a Bible class. This is not a lecture. Okay, I don't know what you feel like a lecture. I want it to be much more casual than that. Matthew five, uh, thirteen through sixteen. You are the salt of the earth. Gentlemen, we read this up on the hill. Uh, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a sand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine 
before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. What does that have to do with managing bad relationships? Let me try to help you follow my line of thinking. Don't go into my head. It's a dangerous place to be. But I'm going to let you in just a few minutes. Miranda is salt and light. And that's a good thing. The salt of the earth, the light of the world. If you mess with her and try to ruin her saltiness or put out her light, she does not want to be your friend anymore. Get it? You see where I'm going with this? Bronson, in his career, is going to shine and display God's work in his life. If you try to take him somewhere where he shouldn't go, or you try to make him think a way that he shouldn't think, or talk a way he shouldn't talk, he just can't be around you anymore. I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into that as we go through these passages. But that's just kind of a heads up of where we're heading with this, okay? Uh, Matthew 10, 11 through 16. Yeah, I better go to the right page here. Uh, whenever a town or village you enter, this is Jesus sending out the 12. Whatever town or village you enter, search for some worthy person and stay at his house until you leave. Now, I understand this is specific instructions to the 12 that Jesus has given them, but I'm going to try to draw a, a guiding principle to, to teach you a point, okay? Uh, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it is not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will get to, here, here's where we're going. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake the dust off your feet when you leave the home or town. I tell you the truth, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. I, Jesus sent out the 12, and there are more instructions and more of the synoptics, the Gospels. Jesus said, you know, go into a town. Go into a house that welcomes you. Be an example. Let your light shine. But if they don't accept it, write it off. Blow it off. Sever that relationship and move on. Okay? You got it? Is this making any sense? Matthew 13 1 through 9. Well, we'll just start in verse 3. A farmer went out, this is Jesus' parable of the sower. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. Birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. When the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop 160 or 30 times. What was sown, who has ears, let him hear. You are the sower. You work with dirt, soil, okay? You are, dismiss the salt and light analogy now, you are planting seed. You are telling others the good news. Sounds good for the first week. And then, eh, that's not for me. See where we're going with this? Sometimes, where you plant your seed, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes you need to continue pursuing that relationship, and sometimes you don't. Not all dirt is good dirt.
Matthew 28, 18 through 20. You can say this without turning there, right? Right? Just go like this if, if you can. Okay, if I tell you it's the Great Commission, then can you do it without turning there? Okay, a little bit closer. Well, I'm going to read it anyway. All authority in heaven, Jesus says, and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. If your relationship hinders you from doing that, Noah, then cut it off. Because this is of first importance. And if your life and your lifestyle and your friends don't allow for this, then you're with the wrong friends that aren't friends anymore because your relationship is not based on First John 4, the love chapter. It's based on something else, which is not the tie that binds. See how this is all like fitting together? Uh, Mark nine forty two. Can you tell I started at Matthew and just went, uh, went this way? Uh, we're not stopping at every book, by the way, through there. Mark nine forty two. And I really didn't make good notes when I wrote down these scriptures. So when I turn to them, I'm saying, oh, that's what I was talking about. If anyone causes one of these little ones to stumble. If anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin. <coughs> it would be better for him to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone tied around his neck. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands than to go to hell, where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where... How do we apply that to relationships? Sometimes you need to keep... Sometimes you need to dispose of. If this is my hindrance, then sever it. If she is your hindrance, then you've had enough. You have better things and better places and better. You have a better life than what she has for you. You can trust her, by the way. Okay, I'm not talking about Miranda. Hey, she not be able to trust you, but you can trust her. Hey, you know, it depends. I'll never stop picking on her, okay? Ever. That's just our relationship. Luke eight sixteen. Luke 8, 16, no one, no one lights a lamp and hides it in a jar or puts it under a bed. Instead, he puts it on a stand so that those who come in can see the light. There is nothing hidden that will. It doesn't make sense if you are, if your mission, your goal, your, your life is to light the world. And you hide your light. Who are you really if you're not shining your light? Or if your relationship with your friend dims your light? Get it? Uh... I'll skip that one. Uh, 
Luke 10 was similar to the Matthew, uh, go into town, shake the dust off your feet. We'll, we'll dismiss that one for now. John 15. John 15. The dinosaurs are vicious this morning. Jesus saying, okay, let me read for a while and then I will explain the analogy, okay, or at least how I see it. Like I said, it's a dangerous place sometimes to be in my mind, but this is how I'm thinking on this. I am the true vine. My father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch that bears no fruit. He prunes it so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. We can stop there. You, you get why we're reading this. Because if you are not rooted or attached to, I am the vine, you can be cut off. But taking that to our fraternal relationships just want to let you know that even with God relationships can be severed if your relationship is not allowing you to bear fruit then you're not in the right relationship okay uh, Galatians 6. No comments, no questions so far? You good? Making you think? Making you think? There's some good stuff in here. You ought to read it. I, time out. Reading your Bible, okay? I was never really good at, well, reading. I was never really good at reading my Bible every day like I knew I was supposed to. Um, this is a nice, this is a nice text. I, you know, it's a nice size. If you are a person who reads, like some people sit down and they can read for a couple hours. We're for, you know, 30 minutes, day, whatever, okay? Um, if we stop looking at this as God's Word, and I don't want you to do that, but look at that, this as a book. This is a book. This book has, you know, I don't want to mess up your spot, is, you know, approximately a thousand pages. That's not a big book. What I did when I, when I decided I was going to do, and I, I saw a read the Bible in 90 days. Can you imagine reading through the Bible in three months? That sounds pretty aggressive, doesn't it? Go from Genesis to the Revelation. See how many pages that is. Divide it by 90, and you're going to go to about 10 pages a day. Who can't read 10, 11, 12 pages a day? We usually we look at the Bible as, oh, I can't read that many chapters, that many verses, that many books, that many. Can you read 10 or 12 pages a day? Everybody can do that. You read 10 or 12 pages a day, you can get through the Bible in three months. That's not real aggressive, isn't it? Okay, and if you want to cut that back... I'm, what I'm doing now is uh, uh, a sixty, or yeah, a six month instead of a three month. In ten to twelve pages a day, you can read through your Bible in three months. The challenge has been thrown out. Okay, 
So what I did is I went just one by my Bible and I counted the number of pages and every 10 or 12 pages, however it mattered to, I just got a highlighter and I highlighted the page. When I hit that page, I knew it was time to stop and go on to the next day. When I hit the next highlight, you know, it's pretty easy to read the Bible. I've since now had a different path, a different way to do that. But with your Bible, you, that, I mean, there's plans available on any Bible app. Be faithful in reading. Reading the Bible is good. Studying the Bible is better. But reading the Bible every day is a really, really good way to start. Otherwise, you just don't know what it says. Okay, now, commercial over, I'm back to live TV. Okay, Galatians 6. Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you are spiritual and should restore him gently. But watch yourself, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's words. We've been reading this, right? But we haven't talked about too much. We talked about bear one another's burdens. But we haven't talked much about watch out or you can be tempted. It could never happen to me. Yes, it can. Yes, yes, it can. We got three or four more, but I was asked for like a 10 minute break. Uh, you might get three minutes um, or we can start a little bit later. Uh, Romans 8, not going to read Romans 8, uh, but if you're taking notes and you want to use this for later, uh, your spiritual versus your sinful nature. Uh, Romans 12, to be transformed into a godly and if your relationship is anyway, uh, 1 Corinthians 15.33 simply says, not so simply, bad company corrupts good morals. Now, don't read that verse. Read the chapter. See what it's all about, okay? Um, Philippians 2. Let, this will be our last one. And I want some guiding principles. Philippians 2. And you asked earlier, but I didn't answer your question. I'm reading out of the NIV. I've been reading out of the NIV since it was first published in the early 1970s. This is my standard. But I read other versions, and that's how I study. Uh, I compare versions, but this is my, this is my base. Okay? Have a base. I, I've got God's uh, last Sunday I preached at home and I used God's word because it was I was pre preaching a, a narrative and I like the way the stories in it flowed okay we use the ESV as a standard I like versions okay and I like to compare reading but that's that, that's my methodology okay sometimes that helps with others okay therefore my brother my friends let's see where I was supposed to start let me go back to my notes 12. Therefore, my dear friends, Philippians 2, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, and continue to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. We're not going to talk about that verse particularly, but there's something here you need to hear. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. And I think every once in a while, one of the, one of the, gospel, one of the Bible writers throws out a verse that if we would just listen to that one verse, we could change the world. And I think verse 14 is one of those verses, but it's getting us somewhere else. And that verse simply says, listen to this. This one changes your life. Do everything without complaining or arguing. Can you imagine if we would just put that little principle into practice? Yeah. Ouch. That one hurts, doesn't it? Anyway, it's getting us somewhere. Do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe. You're the light of the world. 
a lamp on a hill, the salt of the earth, shining like the stars. There's nothing more brilliant. Have you ever, have, have any of you, anyone else, anyone besides me, ever been to a, a, a dark sky, seen a dark sky? It's life altering. Where you can't make out the, the Big Dipper and the, the Orion and the constellations you don't see. Because of them the, <laughs> and so many other stars around them, it just lights up the whole sky. <coughs> In which you shine like the stars. Don't let your friends be a full moon. I was at the Great Sand Dunes National Park, and it's a good dark park, dark sky park, and we had a great picture of the dunes from where we were staying. It was an amazing place in Colorado, if you've not heard of the Great Sand Dunes. And we got up in the middle of the night to go look out at the stars, and there was a full moon. And what does the full moon do? It illuminates the whole sky and dampens the stars. Went to Alaska. This summer, we didn't even see nighttime, let alone stars. It was 16 and a half hours of daylight. You shine like the stars. Okay, I'm about done. Uh, you can close your Bibles. Now you can just listen. Maybe it's time. I've entitled the next section of our lesson this morning, Maybe It's Time. Maybe it's time when you are no longer being a positive influence. Maybe it's time when your Christ-like attitude is being shifted toward a world-like attitude. Or when you are the one who is being influenced instead of you being the influencer when others evil is rubbing off on you instead of your good rubbing off on others well then maybe it's time maybe it's time when you are being drawn away from God instead of being drawn nearer to God maybe it's time when you've tried and tried and tried and you just can't get anywhere Maybe it's time when there are topics that you just can't discuss in a relationship. Yeah, you can talk about sports and the weather, and you can talk about politics even, and work and the economy, and your job, and you can talk about your family, but you can't talk about your religion, your God, your church, your faith, or your Savior. Maybe it's time. Maybe it's time when you want what they have instead of them wanting what you have. And then I thought, if we need more time, which we don't, we're out of time. There were other avenues that I could have pursued, such as, what else? Hold on. My wife's calling me. No, no, I need to check on to see. Yeah, the Braves beat the, the Pirates beat the Braves last night. That's kind of, that was kind of cool. And did you see, did you see Texas beat Alabama last night? And we can get so tied up in that kind of stuff that this is what our relationship is with, and it's not with God. So maybe not always who is your relationship, but what is your relationship with that is more important than your relationship with God. And if your friends draw you away instead of drawing you near, think about it. Maybe it's time. Any comments? Any questions? Everybody get it? You see where we're headed with this? Thumbs up. Thank you. Thumbs up. Okay. Think about it. Think about your friendships. Think about your relationships. Think about what you have in common with others. This is the tie that binds. This is what's going to get you to heaven. 
out. Take somebody with you. Take everybody with you. That's, and those are the basis of your relationships. Okay? And if this isn't the basis of your relationship, well, maybe then it's time that it's severed. Hey, right. hey, appreciate your attention this morning. You're spot on. Okay. We had some good, we had some good, uh, good things to think about this weekend. All right. And more to come. Take a break. Stretch, take five minutes, go use the restroom, get your Bible, whatever you do, and we're going to come back here for our assembly, okay? Thank you.